I'm Dan Doolan. I'm Chris Billingham. And join us as we venture into the unknown and overanalyze the garden wall. Nailed it. Great introing, Dan. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> should it's been a while. Should we clarify that for us it's been months? <laughs> yeah, so for you listening, it's a week has passed, based on the previous conversation. For us it has been, and I checked today, six and a half months. Six and a half months. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. Yes. So for those who don't know Where what happened. Time gone, Dan. Well, basically what happened was there was a Steven Universe hiatus in uh, sort of late last year, around sort of September. And we were like, brilliant, great time. While there's not no new Steven Universe, we'll go down from two episodes a week to one episode a week of Steven University, our Steven Universe podcast. And then we will, uh, on the side, low key, record a few episodes of over the uh, over analyzing the Garden Wall. The notion being that it could be we could release it in sort of autumn. It's a fall kind of show. It's an autumn kind of show. You know, dead leaves on the dirty ground. It's a whole. You know, there's a whole autumn theme to the show you know as it's a vibe yeah yeah there's a vibe well the seasons in general is a vibe in the show but i, I always get an autumny vibe for it so f- the fall felt really nice to release this um and uh we recorded three and then we just couldn't find time to record more towards christmas and um yeah it just fell to the wayside basically because we were just so busy around you know leading up to christmas we were very grateful that we only had you know one Stephen University a week because we, we you know we, we we struggled and then hilariously you know Stephen Universe came back at Christmas and then we had you know January February this year we're taken up with that and then we took a little break and then it was like hey welcome back to podcasting um so yeah so that's how we ended up here I had no comprehension that it'd been six months though in my head it was like three three months two yeah, months no six that's and nice. a half months we was I, I've got a I I, tra- I traced it back through looking at we recorded the first two and then I emailed Fretzel who does our music to ask him if he'd be interested in doing the music and sent him the first two episodes and that conversation happened on the 20th of September and at that point we'd already recorded two so um uh, you know you can do the math on that that at least two weeks had passed since we'd started so yeah. it was mid to early September so how have you how have you prepped for this then? Have you watched the episode the episodes again? What have you done? Um, so I watched the, all the episodes up to this one, and I listened back mm-hmm. t- for for my sins to all three podcasts. And I think I'm really pleased with how the first two turned out. Don't know what I was on in the third one. Got got some issues with myself and need to maybe address <laughs> what happens when we do a podcast when I've when there's a whole weird energy going on and I'm half asleep because. <laughs> Third, third episode I found very difficult to listen to because I was being annoyed by myself, which is pretty. That was a pretty interesting experience. Uh, <laughs> what? What? So I've I've not seen the episodes, but I've listened to the podcast deliberately. I might not have done that if I'd have known it had been six months. Uh, but my logic was I didn't want to just watch the episodes because I didn't want to spend this saying the same things I'd said the previous do you know what i mean because yeah, gotcha. for the listeners it's only been a week so i didn't want to be like oh yeah it's like this in episode one i really wanted to just analyze episode four yeah um so but i did listen to the podcast to see what we'd said about it. and actually the podcast gives quite a good gauge of the episode without having to re-watch it yes yeah. we recap and then as we're talking i'm like oh yeah so i've also heard them what annoyed you specifically about last week then <laughs> just me i just had a real weird like like the, yeah, you nail it in the first like three or four minutes. You say something like, "Well, this has started with a I bit of a weird say. energy," and like, and it just yeah. carries through the whole podcast. I'm like, I'm j- I'm gibbering. I'm like, I keep starting up as if I'm going to make an actual point, but I can't quite articulate it. So I'm just circling around it while my brain tries to fire and work. So listening to myself try to construct co- ideas and thoughts when I'm normally a, a, or certainly based on the first two a little quicker to the mark <laughs> that was mm. painful it was it was like a plane circling a runway before landing and then the frustrating thing was sometimes i circled for so long you'd rescue me and just take take the point away and just like not, not let it land because otherwise i would have circled forever like the <laughs> so there are some where i circle and never even get to the landing it's a really weird listen for me but, but there's equally there's cuz it's the it's the most i've ever listened to us apart from in the early days of mbs when we'd listen yeah i very, um, I very rarely listen back i mean the ed- as as, and- pro- as some will assume by the shoddy editing <laughs> There were times where, uh, yeah, there are times where in Over the Garden Wall, like you, you ask, you ask me something, and I'll just be like, yeah, and I, and I, in my head, I'm listening to it like, oh, I'm coming up with a theory. Yeah, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to hit with a theory in a minute, and I'm going to, and then no, no, I just, uh, it just sounds like I'm not paying attention. All right, <laughs> but I'm assuming that's a common theme. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to tell. It's not worth us judging ourselves, but we did listen back to the last three, so the six month gap won't shouldn't feel like that to you guys listening no, at home. No, no, no. So it's a frustrating listen as well because in the first episode, I'm like, oh yeah, they need to go through the woods and i'm like oh this is where i do it this is where i'm like purgatory it takes me fucking ages to get to purgatory <laughs> it takes me so long i still think it's purgatory that's <laughs> it's a reasonable theory like i said like i said to you at the time and this is would be my honest answer whether i knew or didn't know where this was going it fits like <laughs> that is like honest so answer. Well, daniel it fits yeah it does yeah, I'm I'm on board. Yeah. I get it. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on board. So let's talk about episode four then, Chris. Uh, before we bore anyone by continuing to analyze our own podcast, um, that we'll save that for um, uh, for overanalyzing the Garden Wall Talk Talk, the Chris yeah. Hardwick presented yeah, yeah. discussion well, you, show. Of you this recap. Podcast. You th- yeah. The, okay. Just uh, just one final analyzing. You you're better at recapping this show than me. So. <laughs> okay. I, d- I didn't really pay attention to the recaps, but okay, I'll tell you. I'll, I, I'll I did it. I did it in the second episode, and it's shit. Okay, <laughs> it's really <laughs> bad. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Wurt and Greg, or Wurt and Bert, as you dubbed them at one point, um, were both uh, traveling through the woods. Obviously, heading to Adelaide with Patrice when they come across uh, during a storm a um a pub. They take shelter, but also they're looking for directions. Um, it very quickly becomes this weird thing where everyone in the pub doesn't seem to live by like being a unique individual human but they instead seem to they have they have titles and roles to play and there's the bartender and there's the highwayman and there's the toy maker and the tailor and uh, they're all trying to figure out what what Wurt's thing is and he's like well I'm just kind of me um and while he's doing that and they're giving him they're, they're trying to figure it out help him with it so they at one point they think he's a he's a young lover and they they're planning a wedding for him and because the, they think he they misunderstand that he's looking for adelaide as he's looking for his lost love so they decide he's like a you know a, a, a sort of a sort of a, an unrequited love not even an unrequited love like a like a like a love story that he's in and then they change their mind and they decide he's some sort of journeyman on an epic quest while all that is happening, Patrice is outside. She hears the the call of a woodsman who is singing some so a woodsman-y song that's like la 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 la, chop the wood and light the fire. And it all seems it all sounds pretty safe and jovial. She wanders into the woods, but then inside the bar, Wurt mentions the beast, and everyone gets a bit freaked out about the whole beast thing. And they tell him all about the beast, and they mention the lantern. And he goes, well, the woodsman had the lantern, not the beast. And they're like, dude, that was the beast. So he runs off uh, into the woods after, I think, a scream from Patrice, maybe? Um, mm-hmm. They go off. He jumps. He, he rides a horse very heroically, grabs a lant- lantern of his own, gets out into the woods, and he finds the woodsman that we met in the first episode, voiced by Christopher Lloyd, um, over Patrice's unconscious body. And he rescues in her and... As they escape, she sort of reveals that she didn't get, as far as she's aware, knocked out by the woodsman, as he assumed, because he believes in a, that the woodsman was the, was the beast at that point. He very bravely saves her, actually. I didn't really comment on that. But yeah, it's a very brave... He sort of like grabs at the woodsman's leg while he gets uh, Greg to save her and stuff. It's really... It's a, it's a, it's a good little scene for what I think. And um, Ratusha reveals that she actually just crashed into the tree because it was so dark and she, she couldn't see. And then the woodsman is confronted by what we can assume is the actual beast. And we get a hint that maybe the woodsman took the lantern from the beast. For what purpose? For what reason? We do not know. There's a few other hints towards what the beast is and does in this episode that we'll get to when we overanalyze it, I assume. But that's the vague uh, basis of the story. And uh, they now have directions to Adelaide from the horse who uh, that, that, that he rode, who turns out talks. Uh, it's just, <laughs> just They just do that at the end. The horse just talks. So there you go. Steve the horse. Um, Steve yeah. the horse. That's good correct. Su- good summary, Dan. Well done. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed it. Um, I really liked this one. I thought it raced along at a good pace. There was yes. I like the beast twist, and then the beast twists twist. So mm-hmm. um, I thought it was cool when we thought it was Christopher Lloyd's character. I thought it was cool when it turns out it wasn't. Um, the I found the comment about the oil and the daughter really intriguing. Yes, we'll, um, we'll break that down in a little Greg, bit. Greg, Greg doesn't get a lot to do, um, but I think that's fine. I think it was, yeah. I thought the young lover thing was interesting because I was like, 
they've obviously each got their role. And again, I'm I'm obsessed with my purgatory thing. And I'm like, he is the young lover. Because obviously in the first episode, he's all heartbroken and, and talking about this, this girl. Yes. And I was like, they, they think for Adelaide, but he is the young lover. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously it becomes the, the kind of pilgrim thing. And I like the hero of your own story. Um, we, you know, we talked a lot about this, his, his character's growth and I'm beginning to kind of wonder, is it in, you know, is it in his head, all of this? Right. Um, is it, is, is it he, he, him alone that's in purgatory and, and Greg isn't? And I think, you know, they, they call him the hero of his own story. So I found that quite intriguing. Um, and it was, yeah, it was fun. I don't think it was as outright, I don't think any episode has been as funny as the second episode. Um, yeah, the, but the, the, were... the Pottsville or Pottsfield, Pottsfield, it's field, isn't it? That episode is probably of the four we've seen for for sure the funniest. Yeah, and uh, but it was, you know, it was just a, 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 a Rick rollicking good time. <laughs> yeah, it, it does have a lot of comedy in it, particularly like they do do. Greg doesn't get a lot of story, but he does get a lot of great one liners in this episode. When he's like, I'm, you know, yes, I'm Greg, yeah, and I'm, and uh, uh, I'm hungry. That's a horse, <laughs> you know. Like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great gags, yeah. especially early in the episode when he keeps talking about how hungry he is, and then in the background on one of the scenes, you just see him just stealing food essentially in the background. <laughs> yeah, then he's he's just got like a plate of meat when he goes <laughs> to the window and stuff. It's really good. Uh, like, yeah, and even after he's finished that plate, he still says, "I'm hungry," which is, I think, pretty funny. Um, so I do think there's a lot of comedy in this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there, there definitely is. Um, it just, I don't think it's as, like, the second episode was really funny. Yeah, it was. But it's definitely, um, it's definitely engaging. Um, and it, it's kind of, it's quite, and like I said, it's a really nice pace as well. It's broken up by the, the mm-hmm. two songs. I thought it was an interesting, I just, I don't remember knowing that they were only half brothers it is not relevant at all but i just found it an interesting detail for them to just sort of slip in i believe this is the first time that's confirmed yeah and um, like i thought like i said in, just thought that was notes. interesting well how do you think that changes the dynamic because I, i've got the exact line here um during Wurt's attempt at doing a song to explain his situation to try and get them to give him directions one of the lines he utters is we're related because my mom remarried and gave birth to him with my stepdad that's mm. the line um to my knowledge, that is the first reference to them being only stepbrothers. Do you think that changes the dynamic at all? Or do you think that's to you that's... Well, it'd be half, bro- half brothers, not stepbrothers. Sorry, yes, sorry. Half brothers, sorry. Um, do you think making um, them half brothers... Do you, do you, how do you think that plays into any of their character dynamics? Or do, you, or do you think it's very, kind of just a detail rather than... Very bizarre. Because I, cause I don't think it should. Um, I don't think it... But it's... you got... You've got ten minutes you, and ten ten minute episodes, and that's a detail they decided to give. <laughs> so, you, I don't know if you could, no, because I think Little Brother alone is enough to get that kind of. He's a bit irritating. He's a bit. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. You know, he's in some ways the ultimate caricature of the stereotypical little brother isn't he Mm -hmm. and i think i think that works just as well little brother or half brother Mm -hmm. um i think it would change the dynamics if it was stepbrother because there's an inherent like rivalry and stuff there see Mm -hmm. the will ferrell uh (laughs) film um will Will ferrell john c Riley. john c Riley. that's it i've never actually seen it but it's you know that that movie is dumb but fun yeah there you go um Saturn, name of your sex tape way um <laughs> and uh yeah what was my point yeah so i don't think no i don't think it should i think actually would, i think i think the true na- but, name of my se- uh my uh sex tape is uh well this started with a weird energy didn't it <laughs> <laughs> carry on sorry i um but, like I say, they don't have much time to give us information, and that's a piece of information they did actively yeah. decide to give us. But, but I suppose there's always two levels to that in any form of screenplay or, 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 you know, or just play even, or any sort of, even in like a novel, I suppose. Sometimes the information is there because it's actually relevant to the plot and the story, and sometimes the information is there just to give you a bit more context for the characters and their relationships to each other. Um, so when I first saw this, and I won't say obviously, because I don't want to say anything beyond what I saw when I first saw it, because I don't want to give anything away, but I didn't find that detail as interesting as like, I think I spoke to Nadia about it. And I think, 
I could be misremembering, but I seem to remember there being a discussion where it, where she felt like it was going to be story relevant. And I just was a bit like, maybe it just helps you sort of understand a bit more why they're not, they don't seem quite as in, maybe in, maybe the idea is that that's why they're not quite as in sync. You know, they're not like full brothers, like, or is it just, or is it just like a, a detail where maybe there's a bit of resentment there because Greg represents, you know, uh, his mother, but this other man that married his mother in the end, you know, and, and, and so maybe that sort of like, Feel you know affects his feelings for Greg even if you know even if it's not that sort of relevant to the story it just sort of contextualizes his opinion of it maybe maybe I suppose does it slightly depend how far down they go d- down this you know how much is it his responsibility to protect him route but I wouldn't he doesn't seem like the kind of character that would be that would have how much he should protect him influenced by whether they're half brothers, friends, step brothers. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's well, I was a, thinking more of it along the lines. bizarre li- detail to give. I was thinking of it more along the lines of in the first episode, he was quick to blame Greg for his troubles. And the woodsman, uh, called, him, the woodsman called him out on that and said, you know, you need to accept responsibility. He's younger than you you know you're together in this like if he's making choices you you can't just go well it's his fault like you have to be able to take responsibility for your younger brother in this to a certain degree and i could see him maybe resenting a little bit that because obviously you know uh if then especially if they're not like if they're only sort of half related i suppose you could see it as i i, I don't know I, I i found that just sort of contextualized his feelings for greg a bit more you could see there being slightly more bitterness there especially if he doesn't get on with the stepdad. But that is also mm. a massive assumption based on the fact that television doesn't tend to do nice stepdads. Um, they've st- I've, there's been a few recently that surprised us. I remember us commenting on that when we review TV shows on our main podcast, Nothing But Static. You know, the stepdad is usually the arsehole. The same way that the, uh, mm. that the, that the current boyfriend in a romantic comedy is usually a dickhead too, you know. Um, and so, and that trope gets broken sometimes, but that is a big trope. So I think there's an assumption that the stepdad is the asshole because that's like, you know, it's just the way these things mm. normally go. Um, but it could be a very happy, functional family for all we know, and therefore it might not be that relevant at all. But I thought, I thought, I well, do think it's an interesting detail, and I agree with you. You don't put that sort of thing in there for no reason. That's for sure. No, there has to be, there has to be something to that. Mm-hmm. What did, um, what did you think of the song? Big fan of music as you are. Um, I think the songs in this show um, that so in Steven Universe the songs are like songs I could listen to outside the context of the show. The songs in this set up atmosphere really well. So the, the particularly the Highwayman song in this, it's brilliantly animated, very creepy, just oozes atmosphere and tone. Um, and it's actually a massive reference to an old Betty Boop cartoon, which I'll get to a little bit later. Um, but it's. It's not the sort of music I would then go and listen to. I wouldn't have that song like on on a Spotify playlist. But in the context, no, of... I wasn't. I wasn't humming it when it was finished. No, no, no. But in the context of the episode, it's a brilliant piece of music. It, 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 it you know, uh, and, yeah. and also the second song with the uh, from from the from the Betty Boop facsimile, the waitress or whatever, the bartender, or whatever. What was actually I can't remember her name slash label. Uh, none of them had real names. They all were just labeled after what they do. Um. I can't remember but, her. But either. when her she did she did the song about the about the beast basically, mm. um, and that was that was a, also a really brilliant song for what it was doing. The lyrics are really poignant, uh, and the actual like uh, the song is very good in the context of the show. But you know, the one song that I must say that I do like from the show though that keeps coming back in undertones whenever they mention Adelaide, uh, Adel- Adelaide, the song that Greg was singing when they were first on their way. You know, he was like, he was walking alongside of him. He's going, Adelaide, Adelaide, mm. come and join our Adelaide parade, or whatever the song was. Like, he, he made up an Adelaide song. The music actually does that tune every time Adelaide is referenced now in the background. Maybe not every time, oh, but a cool. lot of the time. Um, like, particularly, there's one very, very obvious version of that towards the end of this episode that I think is a really neat little detail. Um, that, that There's a musical sting that echoes Greg's Adelaide song. I think that's pretty neat. It- it feels like they're setting her up to be the the other the the counterpart to the beast. Um yes. And the beast certainly seems like 
So let's break down what he says. I mean, it certainly seems to me like the lyrics of the song. I've got them in front of me if you want me to repeat some of them for you. I would love you to repeat some of them. (laughs) So uh, this is what they say about the beast in the song. He lurks out there in the unknown. That makes sense. Seeking those who are far from home, hoping never to let you return. So their goal is to get out of these woods. They've made it very clear that the beast would rather they didn't get home. Um, And then it's, ooh, better be wise. Ooh, don't believe his lies. So he's a liar. For a start, so he's 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 very much like the uh, like the sort of like idea of the devil in that he's a manipulator as well as a danger. He's he, you know he's he could potentially well, yeah. lie to you as well as as, uh, as as attack you physically. You you know he could mislead I, or trick you. I keep coming back to to devil and and to mm-hmm. him trying to keep you in in purgatory and or him having the power. It's interesting the light thing. I'd love to know who the woodsman's daughter is. <laughs> Well, that, that we'll get. Well, there's a, I've got the lines for that as well, a bit further down here. But um, yeah. uh, for once, your will begins to spoil. He'll turn you to a tree of oil and use you in his lantern for to burn. You want me to repeat that one? That's a that, there's a lot to break down in that one, isn't there? So basically, you know, um, you better be wise. Don't believe his lies. And the next line from the uh, the Betty Boop facsimile song is. For once your will begins to spoil, so once you start to give up, maybe, maybe he keeps you in the woods until Mm -hmm. your will gives in and you just start going, this is pointless, I'm not getting out of here. He'll turn you to a tree of oil and he'll notice that the were actually took real heed in that because when he saw Beatrice at the bottom of that tree, he said, you're turning her into an elder tree. He was was Mm. referencing what he'd just heard in the song. Um... Uh, he'll turn you to a tree of oil. So that was, that's where the oil is coming from. It's coming, that's why he's a woodsman, because he's he's obviously... The woodsman is obviously chopping down the trees, and that's where he's getting the oil to keep his lantern burning. Um, so he'll turn you to a tree of oil and use you in his... Um, yeah, and use you in his lantern for to burn. So they're saying that basically the beast uses people and turns them into trees and uses them for, as oil for to run his lantern. Why that is now in the hands of um, the woodsman, unclear. But the woodsman does say, um, "Begone, beast! I fought you for the lantern before, and I'll bite you again." Mm, and what I want to know is why isn't everyone a tree then? How, what, all the people in the pub, the people in the school, like mm-hmm. that's what's intriguing me. Stop well, turning everyone into that. Yeah, it does seem to be there's a difference between our travellers and the residents, isn't there? There does seem to be... Mm. He does seem to have interest in the, the two boys travelling through the woods rather than the people who seem to reside there. That is, there. I noticed that as well when I first watched it. Is that covered? I mean, uh, like... I think, what's gr- I think what's cool about the way this show works is because it's only 10 episodes, there's... Covered in that there is enough information later on for you to, to sort of, if you, you know, to piece together a theory of your own rather than outright okay. l- definite defined rules. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, y- yes, but not as directly as maybe you'd hope. So I'm- hard, yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, so uh, I, you know, I, I think that's really interesting. And I, w- I'll say as well that, like, um, he the the line that you picked up on is the response to the begone beast. I fought you for the lantern before I fight you again. Line which is no need for violence, woodsman, but be sure to keep it lit, or your daughter's flame will go out forever. Now, what direction did those children go? Mm. Oh, and that's the the thing I didn't mention in my actual in my uh, in my intro. I oh, know we'll get we'll finish talking about this first, and I'll talk about the other thing. Why did I? Because then they close up on the lamp, and it almost looks like something's in the lamp. But then I was like, "Is his daughter Beatrice? Is his daughter assuming I'm right in the real in you know in the uh, in the real world? Mm-hmm. Is the woodsman looking after his daughter? I just don't know. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. I mean, it'd be cool if his daughter was somehow Beatrice. That might be quite fun. Sure. Because just because, but she, she's the only other one we're really being made to invest in. Yeah, that makes sense. But then why? Oh, I don't know. You'd think he'd be showing more emotion at seeing Beatrice lying there. 
Unless he's his daughter is assume working on the like coma theory, he's somehow keeping his he died and he's keeping his daughter in a coma by collecting the oil. Yeah, I mean, it's then a, it's a it's a that's a very literal sort of like practical theory that does fit in with your existing one, so it makes sense. But then, what? Why is everyone else able to do it on their own will, and his daughter? He's in charge, you know. Well, I mean, if you go back to the we, I mean, I don't know if I'm feeding you too much here, but if you go back to the song, you know, um, he'll spoil he, ah, um, your will begins to spoil. He'll turn you into it, turn you to a tree of oil, and use you in his lantern for to for to burn. Oh, so his daughter's in the lan the oil in the lantern. I mean, you you certainly that was certainly. Um, something that was discussed okay. between me and Nadia as an option back in the day, and that th- that would explain the close-up shot of the lantern specifically after it. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so cool. I love the fact that it's ten episodes. I love the fact that it was written. You know, this shit is written to be answered, and it's uh, it's all part of a of a plan. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, actually, because apparently, um, I've sent you some pictures, by the way, that we're going to come to in a second, so you may have seen your phone light up there with me on that, don't go to those just yet. Um, it's interesting, because I found out today the reason it ended up being a miniseries, I did not know this. So there was a pilot, which also exists out there, that's not part of this 10 episode run, where it was called Tome of the Unknown, and it was, uh, the premise seems to have been a bit different, they hadn't worked out the details yet, it's a bit like the... Uh, the Steven Universe pilot in that it's not canonically part of the show at all, but it gives a good idea of the tone that they were going for and the, you know, the style and sense Mm. of humor they were going for. So it's pretty cool in that sense, but it doesn't really affect, doesn't really affect the actual show. But um, he made that and they wanted desperately to make it into a full series. Cartoon Network were really beseeching him for it apparently. And and basically the creator of the show is like, "I, I can't, I cannot move to LA for any number of years. I just can't do it. I want. I need to live somewhere where they have seasons actually happening, <laughs> because LA is, uh, you know, famously its weather basically never changes, no matter what's going on. You know, winter is hardly winter in LA. It's still pretty sunny. So like that, you know, he sort of complained that LA doesn't really have seasons in the traditional sense, and like that he didn't really want to live through that. So instead, he wow. they, the, the 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 decision was made that he was like, I will come out to LA to make the show, but I, I just want to do it for a bit, and so we'll just do ten episodes. Wow, so isn't that really interesting? That's crazy. Did he? What else did he, the creator done then to be in a position to well, negotiate I, that? I, I, you know what? I don't know, but I guess um, I guess they just like the pilot a lot. Um, I'll, I'll double check that while we're, while we're talking because yeah, you'd ex- yeah you, you must expect that the creator must be like must have yeah. It's Patrick McHale, so let me just. Look at what else he's it's done. Some negotiation, and obviously also to not to not be of the mindset of well, I need I need to do this. You know what? Weirdly, pretty much not much else. Something called Blackford Manor, and something some other short called Thank You. There's very little on his IMDb. So yeah, I guess they just really liked the. Um, I guess they just really liked his. Uh, pilot. The pilot. Well, yeah, he worked on well, a couple of other shows. Though. He must have had a good relationship with Cartoon Network there because he worked on a few of their earlier shows as um, storyboard eyes. So he worked on Misadventures of Flapjack. Um, he was a storyboard artist. Oh wait, no, what's that? After leaving Flapjack, he joined storyboard artist Pendleton Ward. Oh, he helped develop Adventure Time with Pendleton Ward. No, oh, okay. So, I mean, that's got it. You've got to have some sway if you've helped put Adventure Time yeah, on Cartoon that's... Network, I suppose. Um, that is some sway. Yeah, because that's a that's a hell of a show, isn't it? So, um, so yeah, so that's that's the stuff he worked on. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's interesting that I, I I sort of really respect that he was just like, no, I'll just do it my way, thanks. Yeah, and I think it's working out great. It's you know, um, this is it's so, again as I, as I have said before, it's it's difficult in a way because it's. Um, it's this. This is both a great way, you know. It's fun to to chat to you and put stuff out there and stuff like that. But the 
the ideal way to watch this is one after the other without analyzing it for half an hour, 40 minutes. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's, that's, that's fair. <laughs> but I mean, so like, there's, so there's all these hints about like the, how the, the, the beast sort of works and what's actually going on. But it, but for me, I think what I like most about it is just the, the character angle here, because like, as much as like you going, Oh, what's, what's going on? Like this, the idea that this woodsman was trying to help them the first time. Um, and they've come in yeah. now and like, run off on their of their own accord because they think he, they thought you know they mistakenly think he's the beast but he's still telling the beast you know be gone like i've fought you before i'll fight you again you leave these kids alone like you know yeah i love i love let the children be like i love the idea of the the silent protector and stuff um and i think that's it, it, such a fascinating dynamic of what happens when they next bump into him you know yeah 100 percent. i think the design as well is really cool the idea that he's like this shadowy figure with these like look like antlers or something sticking out from either mm-hmm. side. Really cool design on the beast. And also like when you hear the beast, you think sort of you do think animalistic. This sort of mm-hmm. um, more like devious sort of uh, it, 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 this sort of devious devilish character is is kind of a, a left turn really for what you'd imagine the beast to be. And I think that's really clever, and I think that's really cool. And I think that that leans into the sort of turn of this episode, because, again, there's that guy at the beginning that's like, you know, what does he keep yelling? He keeps yelling, the beast is upon me! You know, um, and, like, I don't know, maybe that's his job. He just runs up and down yelling, the do, beast is upon me. I'm not really sure. But um, Do you think, do you think just because I don't particularly have any more beast theories, so sorry to change the subject unless you had anything else to, to say? Um... I yeah I guess the point I was just sort of rounding up to with the beast is I think what they did in this episode that was really clever was they subverted a lot of your expectations of that character and what that character is and yeah. is and, and and the beast in in a single episode you go well that was the threat this week great move on because a beast isn't that interesting but now with this episode it's sort of established that the beast is actually a bigger part of the law and not just a one off thing and will definitely be running through mo- you know the yeah, main premise which is awesome. of the, the you know. it, it, and a clever way of doing it, you know. This is this was almost this was this was Thanos chatting to Ronan mm. in Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> and we've <laughs> yeah. we've yet to have Infinity War. Um, yeah, and I, I did, and I like the the sort of character angle of it as well. This like this idea that's manipulated is talking to this woodsman, and the woodsman is clearly lost, and but still is is still he he's lost someone clearly, and. He's still fighting for the for the protection of these two kids, maybe because of the loss that he's experienced. Um, I like how it characterizes the woodsman. So the beast inclusion in this episode is really important, and makes it and, and elevates it from just being a fun little jaunt in a in a local sort of um, bar to being something more interesting. But do you, do you think the bar the bar jaunt suffers because there's been so the pumpkins had a story, an ABC. The the yeah. school has an ABC. It it really is a jaunty song. There's no story to the bar people in the same way. No, there's um, a little bit so of character d- exploration uh, in their ideas of uh, in in their ideas of who Wurt is, and this idea of giving him a uh, giving they wanted they wanted to define him, but he's himself. And then there's this, there's this great because of them and the way it plays out. There's this turn to bravery at the end for Wurt, which feels both out of character and also right all at once. Um, and I think that's really clever. Um, I, I I like that. I like the way they sort of made his character go from being reluctant to having a friend in danger and you know jumping on a horse and riding in to save her. <laughs> like I think that's that does feel like yeah. a big big moment moment for him. And that I think that comes from his interactions in the bar. You know, I don't think yes, but it's not. It's not their story, though. Um, no, it's way, not at all. The had a story. No, but, no, no. They're a, ca- they're a was... catalyst for, for, for Wurt's sort of evolution rather than actual... But is... Go on. Is that a bad thing, though? Because I was going to say my other question was going to be, do you think this this reoccurring theme of go somewhere, meet the people that are there, have a bit of a thing leave do you think that's going to become repetitive and i think potentially if this is a hint to well we're not really going somewhere and telling stories there it's just adding to the backdrop of the woods because i don't if we were still doing that in 10 episodes time it i i want it to build well, there's, there's only there's only, there's only six left so 
Yeah, well, exactly. And I, but so. I want those six to. I want those. I want you know. I want to keep seeing the beast more and the woodsman more. I want it to come to start. You know, coming together more than going somewhere for an for an adventure. Um, do you, were you thinking that at, that that at this point? And do you think? It being the the people in the bar not really having a story is a sign that we are lending, lending, leaning towards more to more. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, at a certain point, like in a longer show, in a show that's running multiple years, we'd still be just doing townsfolk of the week for sure. Mm -hmm. But in 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 the version of this show that's a mini series, you do have to start sort of leaning into your overall narrative mm. so if you want to start wrapping some of the, the the bigger ideas up so yeah yeah i think that's exactly what's happening but i think if this episode's one of its weaknesses is that it doesn't find a way to do both very don't, doesn't find a way to do both concurrently um but i do think mm-hmm. there are episodes coming up that do a better job of not feeling like those two things are that separate where they manage to move mm. the thing forward and there's the new person and thing we meet that week. Do you know what I mean? New situation they stumble into. Yeah. They find a better, there's a better balance for that going forward, I think, than this one. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think that necessarily makes this one, it makes it slightly no, weaker, don't. but it's still very enjoyable. So I don't think it's no, a huge, I don't be- it's not a huge, like, uh, it's not a huge sort of nail in the head of this one. It's 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 just a small, f- tiny little niggle rather than an actual like no I, issue. I don't, and I think the reason it's not is because a song is naturally quite upbeat and entertaining. You you replace all of that song dialogue with mm. a conversation, then it suffers. But because you kind of go right, we're not in the bar for long. What's the most entertaining thing we could do? Okay, let's let's do a song. Yeah. yeah. Um so although the song isn't inherently catchy, let's do a song, let's do that beast intrigue, do that beast twist and have these people deliver things, either character stuff or story stuff in an interesting way. I think that's what that's what saves it. Mm. What were you What were you going to say earlier when you said, "Oh, we'd we discuss that in some." Oh, like yeah. So the, the one, one thing that I really like as well is this reveal at the very end of the la 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 chop the wood to light the fire. Actually, being the beast, mm. because yeah. it, because it's so jovial, you 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 can't quite. It doesn't sound like Christopher Lloyd, so you're like, "Well, it's, I don't think it's the woodsman as we know him," but you assume it's someone else when when. Um, Beatrice goes after that. When Beatrice hears it. Yeah, yeah. sorry. When Beatrice hears that sound and goes after it, the last thing you're thinking is that's the sound of the beast. And even at the end of the episode, when you're introduced to the beast, you're still not thinking about that. But then there's this glorious, very clever moment at the end where as he walks away from the woodsman, he sings that song in that exact same way. Um, and I think, that's, uh, I think that's really clever. And I, I just remember, even when I first watched it, thinking that was a really cool notion. Um, and again, it, I suppose that lends into the... Uh, the thing I was thinking of, which is this idea that this whole episode serves to subvert your ideas of what the beast is. Yeah. And that's that, that is really clever because obviously you're, and it's not just, it's not just the term beast. It's very much between the stuff with the dog and in general, the way it's described and the shadows in the first episode, you Mm. do, you are picturing this big, you know, dog-like beast beast, like an animalistic beast. So to have it be this slimy, you know, almost human, but we're not quite sure whether it's human or not, creature um, who's who's conniving and, you know, playing chess pieces, it immediately, it's a it's such a clever thing to do to you, whether you're invested or not. If, if it subverts an expectation and subverts what we think we know, it's automatically going to engage an interest a little bit more. Yeah, I'd agree. I would agree. Yeah, and and I think what's interesting as well is, I think you've in a show like this where you've only got ten episodes. I think they've. I think at this point, I was starting to go. Well, I think what's clever about all this in general is a lot of this is more sort of thematic than, like, it's mm. all very dreamlike, and therefore, in quote marks, explaining a lot of this doesn't seem like you need a big leap or a big 
exp- you know you don't I I didn't I didn't feel like this show had set itself up in a way where I would need a big info dump at any point. I felt like a couple of key things were going to make a lot of this make sense very quickly, even if only sort of like in that sort of more ethereal dreamlike way than a direct practical science. Do you know? Do you, do you see what I mean when I'm talking mm. about the difference between the two? Because I think you look at a show like Lost and Lost set itself up in a world where you felt like you needed factual details, explain how this world works in like utter, like I want to know why this thing does this thing and this thing does this thing and why this person did this. Whereas with this, I always felt like it's also sort of, it's all very atmospheric and sort of dreamlike that I feel like a couple of quick, you could easily explain this very quickly with just a couple of sentences if it is something sort of purgatory, dreamy, like that, because a lot of it then doesn't necessarily need to make practical sense. If it turns out to all be in someone's head, for example, do you know what I mean? Mm. Like then, yeah, you, yeah. Th- then, then a lot of the weirdness is actually character work rather than practical do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. And I no, think, it does make and I think sense. Sub- and, and I think subverting the beast is a sign of that, what they're doing there, which is like, d- doesn't, you, can, you can go, oh, what physically is the beast? Well, the beast is kind of whatever the beast needs to be. Like, you, can, you know, people are scared of it as if it's this rabid dog creature. But here you've kind of met, an, you know, this incarnation of it, and it is clearly like more of a conniving force of evil. Um but even that doesn't feel that defined, but it, that feels like enough information to go, I get it. I get what the beast is now. Have I physically seen exactly what the beast looks like? No. Do I know exactly how the beast physically works in the reality of this world? No, but I now get it. Does that make sense? This was the episode where that sort of hit me with this show. Where I was just like, they've done a really clever balance of this sort of mysticism mixed with mystery and i think it works yeah. in the show's favor and i think that's why it's such an enjoyable ride because you you're not even necessarily worried about like the exact nature of certain stuff because you just sort of it's it's a weird no. mystical world where that sort of thing you know it sort of fits it fits in a really yeah way. i'm i'm wor- the, and the more mystical stuff i am worried about feels like it could it could be linked to the explanation so i think it's they do a good job of making me go what's going on with the pumpkins and kind of what's going on with the people in the bar, but why? Why is the horse talking? Meh. Do you know what I mean? That's more mystical part of the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and and, and in terms of, um, so I, I guess we move on to some of the like the little details, like a couple of missable details, and a tiny bit, a tiny bit of truth, very tiny bit, if that's okay. Unless you've got anything else you want to say overall about the episode. No, no, no. Cool. Uh, so one of those little black turtles from the very first episode is on the tree stump when the woodsman approaches it. Cool. Um, I thought that was a nice little detail. They clearly live and hang around those weird oil trees. Um, it's really interesting that uh, basically the tavern people try to peg work, with, you know, like as a, as a sort of stock character, the young lover and the pilgrim, because they're sort of they think he's on some sort of quest, I guess. Um, but what's funny about that is, like in reality, if you're actually going by screenwriting archetypes, work actually fits into the category of every man, because he, you know. But even though he fits into the character character of every man, and he even says, I'm just a guy, I guess, there are traces of the two characters they've found in him. So, the you know, he does pine for a lost love in the first episode, and he is sort of on a quest. So they have, yeah. they, they've not pulled those things out of their asses. He's just more complex than that. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that what the sort of stuff they're doing is the sort of stuff like the sort of character archetypes are sort of based in literary or like in screenwriting terms, like archetypes that are very popular and and repeatedly used. Um, And I think that's, you know, a a tavern full of people thinly defined by labels. It makes sense that they can't quite work out our everyman who fits multiple labels because he's actually a well-rounded character. <laughs> it's funny, though, because most of their labels aren't aren't em- as emotive as the Pilgrim or the Young Lover, like no. the Baker. They're quite... They're very descriptive. They're yes. very... You know, the the job titles. <laughs> Absolutely correct. Yeah, 100% as well. Um, so, yeah, so... And then, obviously, the Highwayman song is a very, very direct reference to a old Betty Boop uh, piece called Minnie the Moocher, which had um, Cab Calloway did a song and they basically animated all this animation around it. And it was a very sort of like the, the song is very much stylistically fits with the song from the Betty Boop cartoon. The animation of the, of the highwayman dancing 
very much fits with this animation style of the original and um and obviously this this episode has the the the, the sort of uh, the bartender lady she is her voice is a very very clear nod to betty boop um so i think that's a really it's cool so it's all very as a song um it's all very cool and response isn't it yes yeah yeah, yeah. like certainly certainly when i actually heard it the other day because um it was on i was just, just flicking through the channels and um one of robbie williams's swing gigs was on it's the one that where they go da da dee da 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 and then the audience repeat it back isn't it mm-hmm. um and yeah he was uh, he was performing that in the palladium dan at the palladium yeah mm. london palladium yeah where i where i've been well, they, so, sorry uh, sorry let me rephrase that uh, he was performing at the London Palladium, where, of course, Dan's been. Yep. You can I went see there. it, but I winked there. I went. I went. I went. I saw. Uh, I saw Jonathan Pye. A very different show, I imagine. Yes. <laughs> yes. But anyway, yeah, he was. It's a good song. Yeah. Um, Robbie Williams does a good version of it. <laughs> great. <laughs> Not right relevant to Over the Garden Wall, but we'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's more relevant than you than Dan's visited. That's fair. I was c- commenting on the song and the call and response nature of it that was used in the episode. Fair. Did they did the characters at any point rally against Brexit or Trump? No, well, it's not that relevant to Jonathan Pye. Carry on. <laughs> um. Not one of the characters in the tavern reveals their names. They only are revealed by titles or slash professions. Um, I've been to taverns. <laughs> <laughs> the Beast song on. of La 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 Chop the Wood to Light the Fire is sung in the tune uh, of an uh, aria in scene three of act one of the opera Hansel and Gretel. So the opera I know version that. of... I've clearly not seen it. <laughs> the Hansel and Gretel opera, which I've definitely not seen, but apparently it's uh, the, 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 that song is sung to that tune. Cool, nice. But there are loads of like it's interesting because Hansel and Gretel in general, and you know, mm. over the garden wall, like that. Th- those two things are not that dissimilar. I mean, it is ultimately no. kids lost in the woods, sort of you know, thrust into potential harm in their yeah. innocence. Like, I don't know. There's, there's. I don't think that's. A, I don't think those two things are a million miles away. Um, no, I agree. And then an interesting one. Now, so one of the characters in this is called the Toy Maker, right? In the yeah. tavern. And he is, at the beginning, you'll see him carving a wooden toy of another person who is actually in the bar. Oh, cool. One of the other characters in the bar is the is obviously the basis for this toy he's designing that's made of wood. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the first episode, Chris? And I told you that the, the woodsman was briefly visible in the opening scene of the very first episode. Yeah. While the music played. If you open up your yeah. phone... I have sent you three images from the opening scene. Um, of the uh, from the whole show. Have you got them up? So the first one I sent you, I think, if they came in the order I wanted them to, should be some toys. Some what? Toys, like figures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the middle one. It's the Highwayman. Yep. Oh, yeah. So this little shot that seemed like a, just a random artistic shot in the first episode was actually a reference to this specific episode because that is the uh, that that toy there is based on the Highwayman. You've got to assume that the toy maker also made toys, just made toys of people he saw, basically, and met. Um, and that, that one there in the middle is the Highwayman. And if you go along to all that's the other... The, other... That's the dog from the bar, isn't it, in there as well? Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Didn't even spot that one. Good eye. Very good eye. You're bang on. And if you go along to the next image I sent you, this is also from the opening title sequence of the very first episode. It is a circus with a uh, with a gorilla juggling. And as we now know from um, uh, school... It's not schoolyard, is it? It's school, school house follies or whatever that episode was called. That gorilla is actually the uh, the that that guy in a gorilla suit. Yeah. And then if you go along to the third image I've sent you, that is um Enoch the cat in Potts Pottsfield. Enoch the cat turned out to be 
that cat turned out to be the uh, source of the voice inside the giant pumpkin head that sentenced them to manual labor. Oh, nice. So three of the episodes we've seen were referenced in the first episode's opening sequence. Now I'm going to suggest Money. you. I'm going to suggest you do not go back and rewatch it because I don't want you to pick up any hints for future episodes. But okay, uh, I, I, th- I, it's, I thought it was about time I pointed out that every episode seems to have have some sort of reference. That's cool. In the uh, in the in the in the very first time. So when maybe we finish the series, you should go back and have a look at that. Or I could just keep you sending you this, sending you the it, relevant yeah. screenshots, maybe. <laughs> Um, no, 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 mind. Yeah, yeah. No, we do. We we go back. We go back. We talked about doing a slightly longer last episode, yeah. or doing two or something. So yeah, cool, cool. Um, so there's that, and then in terms of any of those, was there was was there one other one? Was there one other little detail or piece of trivia? No, that was that. That might have been the last one. Any any overall thoughts? Anything that anything you want to add, Chris? I think because I think we're there. I think we're done. Um. No, not really. I I enjoy. I thought it was a good. I I was pleased that we're starting to get some mythology, and I don't mind the move away from the visit ABC stories. Like I say, I think the Thanos is a good comparison. And hey, if we're building to Infinity War and Endgame, crack on. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. <laughs> why, do I, why do I always compare it to Marvel? But no, I thought it was really. I'm really engaged with the characters, the mystery of it. Uh, really enjoying it, and the the tone of it and the color palette continues to amaze me. Yeah, it's really well done. It's it's certainly, yeah, it, and it's got it's it's weird how it finds this bizarre line between creepy and light hearted, and it's yeah, it's it's a it's really I can't think of anything that's managed to walk that line of creepy and fun because mm. it is it's creepy fun. <laughs> mm. Everything yeah, no, about everything think... about the unknown is off kilter and unsettling. Yeah, it's so much fun and silly and like, yeah, the characters they keep meeting are just insane. Like I said, the school town follies, I've just remembered. Um, and, you know, like that guy at the beginning that just kept yelling, you know, the the beast is, uh, you know, upon me or whatever. Like, what a weird character. Yeah, there was a few weird, uh, like, there was a bunch of dialogue, like, hidden in the pub stuff. I really loved that element. Like, the cat's out of the bag now, do tell. Like, yeah, uh, yeah like, just really There was, yeah, there were a lot of clever dialogue stuff. turns. Like, when he goes, that guy is nuts. Mmm, nuts, because he's hungry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's. I will call that everything for this week. So we'll be back, obviously, in a, in a, in a week's time. And, or, if you want. Go subscribe on uh, Patreon because we are putting the episodes up a week early on the Patreon. So if you go, you, you go. know, you can just give us a dollar a, do- a dollar a month, subscribe, and you can you can go listen to episode. You can listen to the next episode now. Why not? I was I, I left a gap there would... for them to go do that. <laughs> I I don't know why you wouldn't, Dan. Quite frankly, no, it would be mad. And speaking of mad, the next episode is called Mad Love. So there hey, there we go. <laughs> there you go. Um, no, you'd be, you'd be you'd be mad not to go give us some money because we're poor. No, um, <laughs> no, we're trying to make the Patreon actually worth having. Now that's the main reason we've done it. And if it's of interest yeah. to you to get to, to go ahead and listen to next week's, you can go do that at the moment. I don't know if we'll do it for every single episode because I'm 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 looking ahead at the very final one and thinking that it might be un, might be a bit mean to make the final one available to patrons before thinking but i've not decided yet but certainly the bulk of the episodes of this are going up a week earlier on the patreon page um so yeah continue to you can if anyone who already supports us there obviously thank you and anyone who would like to you go so it's patreon.com slash nothing but static um also obviously um speaking of mad love mad love to my man fretzel who did the music for this episode um who else should i be that was a funny exchange i did enjoy as much as you were out of it i did that's a good example of you being out of it last week where you're just like yeah, Fretzel, and it just comes across like you've had a fight, and it doesn't help by me constantly being like listener, not friend. But yeah, I would no. That was it. Was bad. That was not. That was not a good Dan performance. That was Dan off his head. No. I don't know what the problem was. I was. I was. We, I was clearly we adore Fretzel. <laughs> we talked about it being quite early, so I'm wondering if I just like cocked up and like just just had not gotten enough sleep the night before or something but anyway different different issue so yeah thanks it's very weird much. though that we like we weren't even releasing them why did we why did we do it if we, like do you know what i mean <laughs> like I, the, the only thing i can fathom is that we did it before then recording something else because it's also quite short so i don't know yeah no i think that's 100 percent. that's exactly 
you've you, I think you've nailed it, which is like the um, the, I think we did it before like an MBS, hmm. which is just a terrible idea. Yeah, we and we, but it's so. But well, that, well, that was, was the six point months we, ago. Now that was the point now we, we have a rule of not doing that. <laughs> yeah, but I think that yeah, but I think as well we were trying to get ahead because we wanted to release them in time for sort of like fall. We were hoping to hit October basically, and this was late September. So I think that's probably yeah, that's probably wrong. Anyway, different story. Okay. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll come back to you uh, in a week's time for more of this. Um, we'll be discussing Mad Love, which is uh, one of the one of the one of, one of the better, one of the, my favorite episodes. I'd say. Mm. Little tease for you, Chris. Intriguing. A good good British uh, a British legend guest cast guest voice in next week's episode. A legend Ooh, of British. Okay. Give me give me give me a hint of what they're a legend for. Comedy. <laughs> from a from the a very more, from a classic British sitcom. But also many other decade. things. But I think most people the classic British sitcom is the uh what, is their most iconic role. What decade? I think that would be giving you too much information, do you not think? Go on, give me the decade. I don't know. If, if I guessed it'll be fucking amazing. Do you, I, do you, I'm not sure I want to give you the de- the decade. I don't I want to give you the it. decade. 70s 70s yeah Ooh. well my instinct yeah would be michael crawford right but i feel like you wouldn't say he was best known yeah for a sitcom yeah i feel like you'd be like sitcom slash west end star yep 70s yeah i'm pretty sure 70s shall i double check that <laughs> just make sure i've not got it wrong yeah yeah, seventies, late seventies, admittedly. Well, mid to late, but yeah. Okay, I'm trying to think of seventies sitcoms, The Good Life. Um. Okay. This is a fun game for the listeners. <laughs> Take it, I've not named the sitcom a British sitcom from the seventies. Yeah, big one. I'm sure Porridge was the Likely Lads. Hmm. Porridge was 80s, I think. I think bigger than both of the ones you've known so far. Dad's Army? Um, it's not Dad's Army. But I'm moving in the right direction. Uh, I mean, moving in the right direction, maybe not so much, but like certainly in terms of Is it weird scale. to you that I'm naming sitcoms but haven't named this sitcom? Correct. I thought giving you the decade would give you this immediately. Because I would argue it's the most famous sitcom from that decade. My mind's completely blanking. I love it. I love that you don't know. Great. Because you're like the British sitcom guy. It's your thing. This is like you... This is... But exactly. This is why it's bugging me. So not the good... Like, por- I'm sure Porridge is later. So it's not Porridge. I'll confirm it's the not biggest... Porridge. But I don't know when Porridge came out. 80s, I guess. Arguably the British... Biggest British sitcom of the 70s. Oh, I mean... But... Some others do have them. I mean... I mean, to be honest with you, one of the numbers. biggest British sitcoms of all time, full stop. Porridge also was the 70s. Porridge would, have, really? Porridge would have technically run alongside it for at least a few years. Okay. Well, not not literally alongside it. but I'll stop trying to guess and, yeah. and let people go, but... Yeah. But it's a, you know, I, I like the next episode a lot. It's a, I think the next episode's a lot of fun. So I'm excited. I'm ju- honestly just sat here racking my brains for sitcoms. <laughs> Dear Lord. <laughs> You know what's amazing is that we're gonna end is this it... we're gonna end this podcast and you're gonna text me in like three hours like is it this? <laughs> yeah, I will. No, I guarantee it. Is it a sitcom you know I've seen? Yes, it's a sitcom that by birthright you are shown in the UK, and if you haven't seen it, then you don't watch TV. Like it's what you're what you're either in the category of people who do not care about television or British sitcoms, or you've seen this sitcom. Jeez, I'd be surprised I'd be, like, if it turned out you hadn't seen this. My mind would melt. I feel like a fool, Dan, because obviously Blackadder is ninety, um, eighties. Yep. Oh, the young ones. Nope. Fuck me. Although the young ones was eighties, though, wasn't it? I thought the young ones was eighties. Yeah, I think young ones. I think you're right. I think young ones. Because wasn't that? It was during all the punk stuff, wasn't it? Young ones. Yeah, it was the alternative comedy scene. So I guess that would have been. And that's, I suppose, that's what I 80, in my mind I'm trying to was the young ones. In my mind, I'm trying to think of like the good life or, yeah. I anyway. Okay. Wow. And for and for listeners, by the way, who don't know who don't know what we're referring to, obviously, um, 
if you go to the IMDb page for this particular episode of the uh, of of Over the Garden Wall, you can obviously see the cast list, and you'll immediate you should immediately know which. Because I, I guess our, to our, for our American listeners, this this sitcom might not be as big of a deal, but um, the, the the actor certainly is. Okay. Cool, because the actor is right. also very famous for other stuff. But the, I think for that, I think household name status may have may have come here for this particular performer. Still not getting it. Wow. No, are they still working? Yeah, occasionally. Sporadic, not, you know. But yeah, well, they're presumably quite old now. But yeah, yeah, re- reasonably old, and and, and but it still shows up uh, showed up on a sitcom. Uh, earlier this year, an American one. Um, he obviously did the voice work for this only a couple of years back, you know. Um, oh, right. Okay, right. Now I know exactly who it is. Fair enough. You figured it out? Yeah. You might as well say it if you've worked it out. It'll be... It'll be oh, my cock. Why did that take me so long? <laughs> what a bell end. It'll be, it'll be John Cleese and it'll be Forty Towers. Correct. <laughs> Forty yeah. Towers, which is oh, arguably man. one of the biggest sitcoms of all time. Yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah, definitely, definitely bigger than The Good Life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you, from and my so, perspective then, you must have, like, you must have thought I was either being an, exaggerating or being a dick, but I, I, now you know which sitcom I'm talking about. Everything I said, accurate, right? Like, one of the biggest sitcoms of all yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, and you know what annoys me? You know what annoys me? I kept thinking of Monty Python, but going, well, it's not a sitcom, and Dan wouldn't make that mistake. Oh, that's Correct. so annoying. Yeah, which is when I was saying right. when cool. I was saying he was famous for other stuff. I was thinking of Monty. He's working Monty Python, but yeah, John Cleese is the actor in the show. I was thinking of as Forty Towers. So yeah, John Cleese is in yeah. next episode. Uh, he has a he has, oh, a, awesome. he has a he has a role. I like John Cleese. Who awesome. doesn't like John Cleese? I like him a lot. Yeah. There you go. Cool. cool. So right. thanks thanks for everyone for listening and to, to, to listening to our new game that we're going to do at the end of every episode, which is guess the British sitcom irrelevant to Garden, you know, over the Garden Wall. But we're going to keep doing yeah. it because why not? So it doesn't matter whether it's connected or not. It's my turn next week, and I'm going to think of a good one. <laughs> Please let's not let's not make people enjoy that. <laughs> Absolutely going to. All right. <laughs> see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks very much for, for listening. We'll see you next time. I've been Dan Doolan. I've been Chris Billingham. And we'll see you next time as we overanalyze the garden wall. <laughs> <laughs>